I suppose to reinforce the uh, reason that Syracuse is 8-1 and one and a very formidable foe for the Mountaineers this weekend, if you take a look at their only loss of the season, it came in a near-perfect game played by Ohio State. And while Syracuse was searching for a new quarterback in that first game, Ohio State had no minus rushing yardage. They were 12 of 13 in passes. They had no turnovers, no penalties, a near-perfect game. That's the only game they lost, folks. Let's take a look at the rankings as they stand this week. Again, a handful of fours. West Virginia 4 and Scripps Howard, Associated Press, USA Today, and UPI. Sporting News still has the Mountaineers number five. Well, how did it get that way? A big win last week at the Meadowlands in New Jersey against the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers. Let's go back to Giant Stadium and take a look at how it happened. Here's Charlie Bauman kicking off, goes downfield to the 12-yard line, and Rutgers hauls it in from there. 13-yard return. Aaron Fulton makes the stop. A spirited game, you can tell by the outset. Here's Scott Ernie, their quarterback. Goes over the middle to Mersola, their big tight end, but it is intercepted by Darrell Whitmore. And Whitmore goes in for the touchdown. West Virginia on the board. Another Bauman kickoff. Boy, did he have his leg going all afternoon long. Downfield. This time it's Allen. Watch this young man go. 92 yards, touchdown, and just like that, the game is tied up at 7-7. Scarlet Knights wanting to do a, a little something strange here with the Mountaineers in town. They're looking for the upset. Here's Taylor over the top, loses the football, and Rutgers comes up with it. The Knights with the football. Ernie back to pass again, goes over the middle, and he intends it for McQueen, but it's intercepted by Bo Orlando back in harness. In second quarter play, Carmen Scalfani, 35-yard field goal, and Rutgers has a 10-7 lead, one of the few times West Virginia has trailed all year. Here's Major Harris getting uncranked downfield. Reggie Rembert, touchdown. We've seen that many times before. 14-10, West Virginia. Mike Botti, their fullback, loses the football. On a fourth down play, he had first down yardage but lost the ball. West Virginia comes up with it. And Harris goes back to pass very quickly thereafter. Finds Keith Wynn. Big first down, the drive continues. A gain of 19 on this play. Reggie Rembert on the reverse. What an athlete. Watch him pick his way down the sideline. Rembert, a 24-yard gain on the play. Andra Johnson. Off the right side, touchdown, it's 21-10, West Virginia. In the third quarter, A.B. Brown gets uncorked. 17-yard pickup off the left side on this one. Harris rolls to the near side on the right, looks downfield, finds Calvin Phillips. And Calvin keeps the drive alive with a 25-yard reception. Here's Scalfani, another field goal attempt for Rutgers. It's good, and it's 21-13. A.B. Brown again. Brown goes off tackle for 18 yards. Still in third quarter action, Taylor atones for the fumble. This time he hits not once but twice and finally gets in for the touchdown. Scott Ernie still playing for the Scarlet Knights. He was to leave the ball game later. His pass intercepted. That's the Ron Ellis coming up with the ball. Ernie back again and sacked this time. Chris Parker lowers the boom on him, a loss of nine. Here's Mike Body, the fullback, a delay off the left side. Body looking for running room. They got him running the wrong way. Cuts to the outside, gain of only a yard, and boy, what a muscle man play that was by Robert Pickett. Here's Taylor off the right side. Seven more for the Mountaineers, and it's 35 to 13, but Rutgers wasn't finished. They didn't fold the tent. Body goes in. That comes from 19 yards out. Back to pass is Tarver, their freshman quarterback. He is sacked by Chris Parker. And Tarver again hits his man. Down on the goal line, touchdown. West Virginia wins it, though. West Virginia's 10th win of the season, a 35-25 win over the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers. But it's time now to hand out the awards for that West Virginia Rutgers ball game. Our key centurion player of the game comes from defense this week, and it was good to have him back in harness. Number 22, strong safety, Bo Orlando. Now, Bo had nine tackles, one interception, a quarterback sack, and a tackle for a loss in the ball game. Congratulations, Bo. Our Caterpillar toughest yard you have seen already in the program this evening, but this one goes from Mage to Reg. Let's take a look at it again. Major Harris, back to pass, eludes a tackler. Downfield, a Rembert, touchdown, West Virginia.
You know, back in the early days, you wanted to be so sure your interview was perfect, you wrote down all the questions and gave them to the person you're going to interview. Those days are gone, and I know that uh, you're grilled every day <laughs> on this football team throughout the season. What might be the stupidest question you've been asked, other than, you know, a lot that I've given you? Well, Woody, probably the stupidest question I've been asked uh, after about two or three games, they wanted to know what bowl we were going to go to. <laughs> that early? That two or three games? That early. They would say, what bowl, Coach? And I'd just tell them probably the toilet bowl. I, I know you've told me that on many occasions. West Virginia against uh, Rutgers, a ball game that I don't think the players were even happy with the way they performed, even though it was another W. Well, I think when we got ahead 35 to 13, if the game would have ended there and they had not scored, we probably would have been happy. But uh, it just was one of those games where we didn't play very well defensively there at the end. Uh, we substituted a lot of players, and daggone it, they didn't stop them. You know what made me feel good was looking down at the coin toss. That's my big part of the broadcast, really. <laughs> I get to do that, you know, and Jack does the rest. But the coin toss against Rutgers had all of our captains there. Bo Orlando was back. He had blood in his eye, too. He played very well. Well, Bo missed the Cincinnati game, but came back heavy against Rutgers and really played well. He's a big part of our football team, Woody, not only as a physical player, but as an inspirational leader. He's a big guy. Uh, our kids just love Bo Orlando. Can we get the big play in on Syracuse? I don't know. Syracuse is a great football team. Uh, we've studied them all week. They have no weaknesses from a personnel standpoint. Uh, offensively, they have an excellent player at all 11 positions. And uh, unfortunately, they're the same way defensively. They have an excellent player at every position. Well, let's take a look at some of these outstanding ball players from Syracuse. And first of all, uh, the big guy that makes them go, I suppose, is an outstanding fullback. We'll zero in here in this first play on number 32, Daryl Johnson. What a bull he is. He never gives up. 22 yards on the play. Daryl Johnson. Here's Robert Drummond. Another one of those bull-type runners for a touchdown. Todd Philcox, the young man they've settled on at quarterback. And he is quite, quite a ball player. Philcox goes to Glover again on a quick out play, and it's good for a 25-yard touchdown. That's against Boston College. Here's Philcox again going to Glover. 25 yards, another touchdown. This ball game was tight until late. Then they rolled away from Boston College, 45 to 20. Rob Moore on the catch. And now Phil Cox hits Daryl Johnson, the fullback can run it and catch it. Look, a little defense here. Rob Thomas. Rob Thompson, rather. Back to pass again goes Boston College. And this by time, Terry, Terry Wooden, the linebacker, comes into play. Comes up with the football, a diving interception. Wooden will sack the quarterback here. He's all over the field. And the free safety, Marcus Paul, their All-American candidate. He's been there for umpteen years. I'm telling you, Syracuse does have the ingredients to be uh, quite a fly in the ointment here tomorrow. Well, Woody, they should be in the top five in the country. I don't know why they're not there, but they should be. Now, Mac McPherson is a good friend of the Don Neelands, and uh, the families on occasion have vacationed together, but uh, there'll be a little intensity <laughs> once you face one another tomorrow night across that, that uh, gridiron. Mac says that you've been holding the team down for the last <laughs> two weeks, and you're going to be uh, really fired up for his ball club, to which you said, well, what they could print, I think, was fooey. Mm -hmm. huh? You well, don't believe that? Well, Woody, we wouldn't hold anybody down, uh, that's for sure. But I think our team will be fired up just like their team. It should be one of the great college football games in the country this weekend. Eight and one, their first loss, Ohio State. Uh, that's really, uh, to go in there and win is difficult. You know that. It's hard to go in there to, and win, but there's no question that Syracuse is a much better football team than Ohio State. Battle Royal, the final game of the regular season. Tomorrow night, Mountaineer Field, West Virginia and Syracuse. Don't miss it. Key Centurion Banks are more involved in education. Whether we're funding a scholarship, taking the time to teach a child after school, or helping you plan for your child's future with a variety of savings options. We believe local banks have a responsibility to devote both financial support and individual commitment. So sometimes, even a banker has to stay after school. I think we got it. Key Centurion Bank Shares, building our communities together.
Key Centurion Bank Shares, official sponsor, Mountaineer Sports. Mr. B Potato Chips believes in the ideals and values athletics provide as a part of higher education. West Virginia University Athletics gives young men and women the opportunity to meet special challenges and to achieve a higher level of excellence. Mr. B Potato Chips is committed to their support and is dedicated to helping these young people achieve their special goals. Mr. B Potato Chips and WVU Athletics, proud to be a part of the Mountain State. My father drove a starship, so it's only natural I'd fly around in something space age. My new Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, totally redesigned for the future. It's powered by a fuel-injected V6, monitored by an onboard computer. I guess some things were just meant for the next generation. This is that, your father's Oldsmobile. Ready, Dad? I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Steady as she goes. This is the new generation of dentures and smoke like John, you can be a fresh mouth too. With Mint Fresh Smokers Polydent. Its super strength cleans tough tobacco stains. Its minty mouthwash ingredient freshens up dentures. Try Smokers Polydent, a mouth freshening clean. About this time last year, the nation just sort of eavesdropped on the final score of the West Virginia-Syracuse game at the Dome. They were shocked that the Mountaineers were still in the ball game with the Orange. It got us a bowl game. Today, Tony Caridi compares that team and this. You know, arguably, last year's West Virginia-Syracuse game was the most exciting game of the entire season. It was a tremendous offensive showdown, which led to a very dramatic ending. Now, one year later, we could be in store for an instant replay. Only this year, the roles are reversed. Mountaineer fans will probably never forget this play. A two-point conversion that locked up a perfect season for Syracuse. Like the Orange of 87 and the Mountaineers of 88, both teams were led by outstanding quarterbacks. For Syracuse, it was Heisman Trophy runner-up Don McPherson, who tailored his game over the years from a runner to a passer. Along with standout receivers like DeVal Glover and All-American Tommy Cade, McPherson was on mark all season long. On the other side, Major Harris has made his mark as a runner, but he can do much more than scramble. He's got twice as many touchdown passes than rushing TDs. And like McPherson, Harris has a favorite target, Reggie Rembert, who's already caught seven touchdown passes. Well, they're probably both very explosive teams. We both have number nine at quarterback, and I, I'm sure Coach McPherson was thankful for that last year, and I can promise you we're thankful for that this year. I think that Major Harris has more tools in 1980 to work with than Donnie McPherson did in 1986 and 87. I think he's got the perfect team around him. I don't think Donnie had as much. I think Donnie would be better with this team because we're getting better. Besides standout quarterbacks, another similarity between the two clubs was a schedule that featured key home games. Like Dorothy once said, there's no place like home. For the Orange of 87, one model held true, there's no place like the Dome. The first real test came against the Maryland Terrapins, and although it wasn't flashy, Syracuse was 1-0. Like the 88 Mountaineers, Syracuse earned road victories at Rutgers, Virginia Tech, and Pittsburgh, while saving the most dominating performances for home games against Eastern rivals Penn State and Boston College. The end result, a berth to the Sugar Bowl. And now a year later, it's West Virginia that will accept a major bowl invitation prior to Saturday's kickoff. Just how did it all happen for the Mountaineers? Let's take a look. Right from the start, one could see that the Mountaineers of 88 were an offensive machine, racking up 162 points in their first three games. Then came those important road victories in Pittsburgh, Blacksburg, and Greenville, which set the stage for back-to-back -back blowouts over Boston College and Penn State. Two more business trips proved successful, and now just 60 minutes stands between the Mountaineers and perfection. The most important ingredient to an undefeated season is attitude. Both these men set an agenda for a season-long mission of excellence. For the Orange of 87, nothing would stand in their way in their quest for a perfect season. 
And now, a year later, that same attitude is alive in Morgantown. They're coming in only with one loss, and that was the beginning of the year. And uh, this year, you know, we, we have something that we want to accomplish. And this day, they the only one that's in our way to where we want to be and where we want to go. This is a team with all the necessary ingredients, togetherness, intensity, and the burning desire to succeed, no matter how high they have to fly. Uh, but I guess it's, it's kind of like being an airline pilot, someone explained to me once, and that is that the airline pilots, uh, they hope to make every landing a good one, but they know somewhere out there there's a bad one. And yet they, they try to go for an undefeated season every year. Coaches are a lot the same way. Uh, sometimes it's not always a realistic goal, but when you get a chance to grab the golden ring, uh, uh, we certainly like to take advantage of this opportunity. Golden ring, and tomorrow we'll find out if the Mountaineers deserve to. Well, I'm kind of glad we're playing at home this week, what with Dwight Wallace's analogy of the airplane pilot and the inevitability and that type. Tony, I think the, there are similarities, but there are differences. This West Virginia ball club has a chance at the national title. Uh, Syracuse really didn't. You're right, Woody. A year ago at this time, both Miami and Oklahoma had stayed undefeated throughout the regular season, and Syracuse had a very outside chance to win the national championship, where on the other hand, those teams have lost this year, allowing it for a team like West Virginia to have a legitimate chance at winning it all. And probably, uh, best of all, Syracuse last year didn't have a Beano Cook. That's exactly true. <laughs> West Virginia simply got the hype when it started right from the very top of the season, and they've continued to. Mountaineers have more interest than football. Lots of little folks are high on their minds, as Kathy Kerchival's reports. When you're part of a highly successful football program like West Virginia, it's tough sometimes to keep things in perspective. But the Mountaineers have some extra help from some special friends at Children's Hospital. You know, it's a great feeling to know that you can make a kid smile and make his day. When I come up here, it makes me feel fortunate that I have my health and my abilities. And, you know, like I said, I love kids and I like, you know, making them laugh and smile. And laughter is indeed good medicine. When the players come up, it, it's a big uplifting factor for the whole floor. I think therapeutically, it's a fantastic asset to have the university, to have the athletic department, especially a coach who cares so much about the children, and the players who actually have become long-lasting friends with some of our children. Now, through the efforts of a few other folks, the kids at Children's Hospital get a taste of game day excitement. But there's more to this story than just visits to the floor. Since 1984, the annual Gold Blue Game has been a benefit for Children's Hospital. The proceeds furnish the playroom and help provide toys, games, and other little extras for the children. But the personal visits are something special to the children and to the athletes. I like to go in to visit all of them. You know, I just go to every room and just to stop in and say hi. And, uh, you know, a couple of kids are kind of shy, you know, to, to the athletes, and they're shy to talk to you. But I'll, you know, fool around with them a little bit and make them laugh and I mean that's really a joy to see a smile you know I love going uh, I go simply because the warm feeling I get inside from the kids I mean they give me inspiration when I see them and I think we do the same for them we give them kind of hope going up there and you know the players that do go they go because they really want to go I mean it's it's out of love for the children that I go I like Eugene's headgear better than his helmet <laughs> uh, just because we're number four and we've got a shot at bigger things to come we don't start visiting the hospital. This has been going on for quite some time. You're right, Woody. It's been going on for 15 years, and Coach Nealon was very instrumental from the very beginning to get this going and, and headed in a very strong direction. And the guys that go up to visit the kids on occasion feel very humble when they leave, and they're just proud to be as healthy as they are. And they're just, they're wonderful, and the kids love them too. They have a good time together, and they Mutual should. Mutual admiration society. Exactly right. Thank you so much for being with us, Kathy. Another outstanding report. Well, we're now starting to count the hours and now the minutes. West Virginia, Syracuse, just around the corner. Nature's light. Bathing fields of grain. Enriching full, fresh hops. Giving life to sparkling streams, nourishing all the natural things that go into making Bud Light. The light beer that's beechwood aged for a clean, fresh taste that makes Bud Light the one light that outshines them all.
King Centurion presents the WVU Marching Band in Concert, capping off WVU Day in Charleston. Monday, November 28th, 7.30 p.m. at the Charleston Civic Center. Tuesday, November 29th, 8.15 p.m. at the WVU Creative Arts Center. Hear the pride of West Virginia from Key Centurion Bank Share, building our communities together. John Denver sang at Take Me Home Country Roads, and on a given Saturday home date, they come from all directions to Morgantown. Dave Weekly's making that trip right now. He says he kind of thinks that this weekend, Charleston may be half empty. All roads lead to Morgantown in the fall to see the action at Mountaineer Field. For WVU fans in the Kanawha Valley, that means heading up I-79 to catch the ears. It's about 160 miles from Charleston to Morgantown. You want to give yourself about four and a half hours to make this trip. I think we're going to stop at the first rest area at mile marker 49. At rest areas along the way, free coffee stands are set up to make sure the Mountaineer faithful keep their vehicles between the ditches. This is for the Frametown PTO. It's for the school at Frametown, which is right off the interstate here. What time did you get your, your biggest business? Uh, about 9.30, probably. About 9.30? Yeah, but okay. they've been coming off and on since. Winnie says this coffee stand at mile marker 49 stays open until midnight on WVU right. game days to help That's the fans fine. get That's home in good shape. We couldn't resist sampling some of the percolated product. There you go. The right there. All right. Thank mm, you. Uh -huh. mm, that's mighty good. They help. Many Mountaineer fans also have food on their minds for the trip. This group from Charleston stopped off for a snack at the rest area near Bridgeport on I-79. Some fans like to make the drive to the University City, while others prefer to be driven. I drove two years ago, but they made me quit driving because I got two speeding tickets in less than an hour, so <laughs> I'm a designated passenger and cheerleader. Well, as you can see, we made it, and we even had time to enjoy the band. Good preparations, that's the key. And you never know who you're going to run into. Well, great, Dave. I'm glad you made it, and with plenty of time. Don Nealon will tell you the best stop is ice cream in Beelington, but then again, to each his own, I suppose. Well, you know, he told us last week that he would tell us about the good things at the end of the rainbow once we won them all. I forgot to ask him about it. Well, maybe he'll tell us and show us on the field tomorrow against Syracuse. The Orange Men and the Mountaineers have been meeting for years. Who cares about the series? It's always a great ball game. We'll see you at the stadium nationwide. Wear your gold and blue, bring your pom-poms, and don't forget, let's go Mountaineers. consideration provided by U.S. Air. We welcome all of our passengers one at a time. The Holiday Inn of Morgantown. Look for officially licensed WVU merchandise from PM Enterprises. This has been a Mountaineer Sports Network presentation. West Virginia showdown Saturday on ESPN continues. Weather always a major factor in a big game. Our sideline reporter John Snyder now has an update. Very much. Uh, 20 minutes ago, I would have said weather would be no factor. It rained very hard until mid-afternoon today. Then it quit for about four hours. Now it's coming down hard again. The field here drains very well. The footing will be good, but obviously holding the ball is going to be difficult. Well, John's going to have his work cut out this evening, Stan White. Well, he sure is. Obviously, the weather is going to play a factor. The one thing they said about this new turf they put in is until it gets a year of play on it, when it gets wet, it gets very slippery. West Virginia won the toss. They deferred to the second half, so Syracuse will receive the football here. And 
and better than 63,000 on hand. The sky is cloudy. They've just opened up, 47 degrees. Very little breeze at this point, really. Uh, earlier today, the humidity was 99%. It rained most of the day, but we got a break a couple hours ago. However, now at this point in time, it's going to drizzle. Yeah, it's just drizzling. But again, that's going to put that smooth layer of wetness onto the field, which may be even more of a problem. You know how the roads are when it first rains. That first rain creates a problem of slickness. Don Nealon already uh, conversing with the officials, wondering why this one hasn't started. I think both teams, Dan, are ready to play some football. Well, I'm sure they are. These teams both remember last year's game when Syracuse came from behind in the last seconds with a two-point conversion to win 32-31. to 31. And now it's on the, the shoe is on the other foot. West Virginia trying for that undefeated season and a showdown with the, in the Fiesta Bowl with Notre Dame. One of the stories to be developed here this evening early is the fact that Don Nealon and Dick McPherson are very good friends they're personal friends and they do a lot of hunting and fishing together their wives spend time together so it's a tough game for them as well well yeah but the one thing you like to do even when you're playing football is play against your friends the one thing you want is bragging rights for another year McPherson had them Nealon wants them Charlie Bauman number eight will kick off for West Virginia back deep number 44 Michael Owens and number 17 Greg Walker there you see Bauman He's a senior, an outstanding kicker. And the game of the century in West Virginia is now underway. Owens gets a little seen and going to get bounced out of bounds at about the 30-yard line, but quickly a flag on the opening play. Let's take a look at Syracuse on offense, led by Todd Philcox, the senior signal caller. Best one-two punch in college football, Daryl Johnston and Robert Drummond in the backfield. The receivers are big play guys, Rob Moore and Duvall Glover. Tight end is huge, Pat Davis, 6'4 and about 260. Offensive line is very good, the center John Flannery. The guard solid indeed, Gary McCummings and also Blake Bednarz in the tackles. Opening Holding on the receiving team during the run back, 10-yard penalty, first and 10. Mike Bednar and uh, Turnell Sims, a little extra air time for those tackles. All right, yeah. Well, they got the break, uh, West Virginia, on the kickoff, and you know the crowd's going to go wild, even at penalties today. This is a crowd that's going to be into this football game. Phil Cox, the big question with him, Stan White, is how that thumb will hold up. It's been nagging him ever since the second game of the season when he injured against the Buckeyes at the Horseshoe in Columbus. Opening series of downs, reverse. Well, it's a fake reverse, and Drummond hangs on and slides for about three yards. On defense for West Virginia, freshman at middle guard, Jim Gray at the defensive tackles. A couple steady seniors in Chris Parker and Mike Fox. The inside linebackers, leading tackler Chris Herring and Theron Ellis at the outside linebackers. 12 sacks for Ronaldo Turnbull and Robert Pickett. At the cornerbacks, Al Foyd, Mays, five interceptions, and Willie Edwards. Safeties, Bo Orlando, and freshman Daryl Whitmore. Second down now and seven for the Orange. Now a little delay this time. Drummond goes up over the top and gets rattled pretty good at about the 29-yard line. Theron Ellis in with the big hit. They call him Mr. T. Mr. T, and a converted outside linebacker. They had problems at the inside with their outside linebackers playing as well. And, this number they, and the number they had, they moved Theron Ellis into inside, and he's done a good job there. Remember, the defense coordinator said he's never had that work for him before. This time, it finally worked. Well, going to the bone early here on third and three. This is the third back through, and he needed to cross the 31. Is not going to get there. Just a little short. As you saw, it took a lot of time. He's audibling, trying to find which side. They run behind tight end Pat Davis. But a great play on the outside by the outside linebacker to stop the play and hold him short of the first down. Number 93. In on the play, Dale Jackson, who hasn't been a starter. He came in on short yardage. Back to punt now, number 29. That is Cooper Gardner. And number one, Brandis Bell, back deep and about the 25. He's a slippery little guy. 
finds a seam and gets tackled by the ankles as it crosses the 41-yard line. Of course, the commander-in-chief for West Virginia's offense is their sophomore sensation quarterback number nine, Major Harris. Two very strong running backs in the backfield and Craig Taylor and Anthony Brown. Receivers are big play guys, Calvin Phillips and six foot six inch Reggie Rembert. Tight end is a converted wide receiver in Keith Wynn. Along the offensive line, he's banged up, and Kevin Koken starts at center. The guards are Stroya and Kovach, and at the tackles, Smiter and Phillips. First down and 10, first offensive series for the Mountaineers as they start from about their 40. Little delay and bouncing outside is A.B. Brown. He's got some room before he's chased out of bounds. On the defense for Syracuse at nose guard, Fred DeRiggi. From Scranton, Pennsylvania, the defensive tackles are Mark Swinson and their best defensive lineman, Rob Burnett. At the inside linebackers, Dan Busey and their leading tackler, David Bavaro. Outside linebackers, Keith Freiberg. He has he leads the team in sacks and Terry Wooten. The safeties, Jeff Mangren and Marcus Paul. And at the corners, Chris Ingram and David Holmes. First and ten after the 12-yard game, Major Harris rolls out, has all day to throw, and Burnett chases him out of the pocket. Tries to load up again. And look at this. He had all evening to get off that pass. Secondary did a remarkable job before Keith Freiberg finally chased him out of bounds. Talk about coverage there. You see how long Major Harris had? I mean, if you put the clock on him, there would have been 10 seconds or more to throw the football. It's tough to stay with anybody. Zone man for that long. But that's what Syracuse has faced today. They knew it. They practiced. It's called plastering, staying with your receiver, staying in your area when he scrambles around. You can't give him that big play. You sit back and make them earn their yardage. Amazing thing, though, he picked up five yards while shopping all day long. Once again, it's A.B. Brown. He's got some running room to the left side. Finally wrapped up and pulled down out of bounds at about the 32-yard line. Jeff Mangrum in on the stop after an 11-yard pickup. Well, this is a counter play. You see the tackle pulling from the left side of your screen. Watch the tackle come across. The flow takes the linebackers one way. They come back with that slight delay. Gets the linebacker out of position and allows the back to make the cut through the hole. You saw number 55, Dan Busey. If he wouldn't have took that false step, he'd have been able to make the tackle. That's what a counterplay does. First down play, and this time it's Taylor who is wrapped up at about the 30-yard line. David Bavaro, one of the first players in on the tackle, but the Orange that time with a nice job of gang tackling. Well, Craig Taylor is a big-time player, six foot 215, but he's as strong a runner as you're going to see. They like to compare him here at West Virginia with the Syracuse fullback we'll see a lot of today, Daryl Johnston. He doesn't do as much as Johnston does, but uh, Taylor really can block and carry for short yardage. 11.49 left to go in the opening quarter. Just underway, no score. Major Harris going to turn the corner inside the 20 down to about the 19. And David Holmes, the last to greet him there. Well, let me tell you, that looked like a broken play. It was a designed to broken play, if there is such a thing. But they went to the right with Major Harris, like he's going to run the option, and let him reverse his field on his own. You know why it was not a broken play? Because the wide receiver was blocking down to the left, down to the bottom of your screen. You know he wouldn't have been blocking if the play was going the other direction. This time it's Jamie LeMond split out to the left. Granis Bell flanked down to the right. And the first down and 10 play. Mountaineers with their opening drive, and it's a good one. Taylor for tough yardage inside the 15, stretches out to about the 13. And Syracuse is going to be in real trouble if they allow the fullback just to get the ball on a straight handoff. Now watch this. This is a straight handoff to Taylor, number 20. Lower his head right here and get six, seven yards. If they allow that, they're going to be in tough situations all day long because you got the win first down against Major Harris against this power offense of West Virginia. Second down now in three, and that's an offensive coordinator's dream. This time in motion, it's Calvin Phillips. Give to the tailback. Brown goes over the top of the stack, hurtling inside the 10, and that looks like it's probably enough for the first down. Bavaro again in on the tackle. I tell you, if I were them, I would hope it'd be short of a first down here. I'd rather have a third down and short yardage at about the 10-yard line than a first down at about the 10, because now I can make two or three and have first and seven rather than first and nine, because yardage is real tough inside the 10 to make. Well, now the power offense is in, a pair of tight ends. Right straight through the middle and down to the one-yard line. And West 
Virginia just owning Syracuse here early. Mangrum and Holmes, the last to stop him. Well, it's real tough if you're going to have a short yardage defense open up this big a gap. Now watch the hole open up right here between number 59 Bavaro as he gets blocked out and you see the other linebacker. They split the two linebackers. Linebackers have to work in pairs. They cannot be split. Bavaro had to come over further and make the play. First down, goal to go. Oh my, what a blast right at the goal line. And A.B. Brown is turned away by Dan who really got the helmet on the numbers. Well, we just talked about them being split. Well, they split the running back this time as he dives and dives over top. Watch Busey, good penetration. He takes the first man, and there's the second linebacker, Bavaro, coming in to make the play. We said they got to work in pairs. That's what we're talking about, working in pairs. Watch this hit by Bavaro right here. Boom, right in the head, knocks him straight backwards and on the ground. That's a big-time hit. Denied once. Here they go again, second down. It's a touchdown. Well, wait a second. Oh, my. Medlam down on the goal line. The officials are confused. One man, single touchdown. The rest of them are looking for the football that popped out. It looked like Taylor was across for the score. Marcus Paul is signaling that they're saying Syracuse has got the football. But the man at the bottom of the screen, the line judge, had signaled touchdown right away. There's also a flag down in the end zone. I guess we'll have to let them sort it out. <laughs> Side on the defense. It will be second down. Well, that makes their decision easy. That's the easiest way out. If that guy called touchdown, it should have been. But they end up with a touchdown. See it? Oh, he's lined up way off sides. The end man in the line, that's Terry Wooten there, a fine outside linebacker. But if you take the penalty, that means it wasn't a touchdown, which means if he wouldn't have been offsides, it would have been a fumble. That could be come back to haunt them later on. Obviously, a big play, a big break for West Virginia. One of the 63,000 holding their breath right there. Now they'll get a second chance. Second down, goal to go. Well, he's done it all season long. Major Harris tried the quarterback keeper. Did he get in? Doesn't look like it. Well, they've tried all three running backs to get through now. They tried the tailback first. That took too long to get to the line of scrimmage. They tried the fullback. That took too long. So they went with the quarterback, hoping he could get over the, the goal line before the linebackers could fill it. And we'll see if he gets in if we look from the side. Does he get the ball across? He doesn't get much of a leap, does he? It all depends where the ball is. Is the helmets across, that's for sure. I don't know how you even tell from either side if he got across or not. Time the charm. Yes, it is. Taylor takes it over, and the Mountaineers are on top. They made him earn that yard. I'll tell you that. Frank Taylor, right there, feeling the effects of constant pounding on those plays. Because you remember, he was the back that led the tailback through on the first down play. He got hit real hard and fumbled on the second down play. Finally got in the end zone, but took more big hits. Well, that's his 15th career touchdown, and it was probably the biggest of his career. Bowman on for the chip shot, and he gets it. So the ears are out to an early start as they lead 7-0 with 8.52 left to go here from Mountaineer Field. Showdown Saturday continues on ESPN. Syracuse versus West Virginia is being brought to you by Dodge Cars and Trucks. On the street or off the road, it's the new spirit of Dodge. By Budweiser, Beachwood Age, for that clean, crisp taste, this Bud's for you. And by Epix, play action BCR football, the football game that lets you coach the pros. Very quickly off to that scoring drive, 60 yards, Stan White was impressive. Uh, real impressive because they went through them quickly and opened up huge holes until they got down to the one-yard line. There you see the two deep guys, but before we get to that, let's take a look at that scoring drive. 60 yards, they ran every play. And 11 is a little bit deceiving because it took three or four to get in from the one. So, as we say, they went down there real quickly, and it took a while to get in the end zone, but Syracuse has got to be saying, we've got to toughen up our first down defense especially. And a little short of this time, and up on it is Greg Walker. 
past the 25, out to the 29. The reason why we had a short delay earlier this evening but because of the start of the game was a headset problem, John Schneider. Well, they still have the headset problem down here, Denny. Normally, these headsets are on the heads of the assistant coaches down here so they can talk with their counterparts in the press box. They do have a phone working, but for the first six minutes of this game, they've had no communication with the press box. Officials are working on it, may get it done, but right now the Syracuse coaches really can't talk upstairs except on that phone. And that's real important, Denny, because they call plays from up in the press box, send them down to the sideline, and then use messengers to bring the plays in. The offensive coordinator can't call from up here. They're really cut off from their football team. George DeLone, the offensive coordinator for Syracuse, probably pulling his hair out right now. First down and 10 from the 29. For the Orange, they trail now, 7 nothing though. Well, they go back to old faithful Daryl Johnson, who came off a big, big game against BC last week. Well, they called Daryl Johnson one of the best or the best fullback in the country, and I'd have to agree with them. This guy may be a first-round draft choice in the NFL. He fit in great down with Don Shula, Miami, because he can catch the football. He blocks great, and he runs from tackle to tackle. And you watch tonight. When they need a big play, when they need a first down, they're going to go to Daryl Johnson. Brings up second down now in about seven. Cox going to look downfield and then swing it out to Drummond, who's got some running room. Oops, slipped at about the 38-yard line. Could have picked up a few more yards, I think, but he went down because of the turf. No, no doubt that the, the thin film of uh, moisture on this turf has made it slippery. When you go to make a cut, when you're not sure you're going to have to make that cut, you don't know how to uh, apportion your weight, that's when you go down. Drummond just short of the first down, only because of the slip. Drummond is only... Uh, Caught 11 passes this season, so they really haven't gone to him much through the air. Two tight end offense out of the wishbone. Johnson going to have enough, I think, for the first down as he's near the 40-yard uh, line. Mike Fox out of Akron, Ohio, in on the tackle. Again, they went back to the wishbone, two tight ends, short yardage offense. And Again, when they need a big play, when they need to keep going, they go to Daryl Johnson. They didn't the first time on short yardage. They didn't make it. This time they said, let's go to our bread and butter, the guy that usually gets it for us. And uh, they're going to measure, but I think he has it. difficult for the offensive coaches at Syracuse not to be able to communicate down to the field stand. That's got to be causing some problems. Well, they did make the first down as we see, but yeah, obviously it caused a lot of problems because they've done it all year long. Talking to uh, George DeLeon, the offensive coordinator, they audible about 80% of the time. Now some of those are insignificant audibles or small audibles like changing which side, right or left, are going to run the play, but still, if you don't have the proper play call, you don't have the sequence to audible from this time, it's Rob Moore split out to the left. Duval Glover flanked to the right. And the slot is Davis. He's moved all over the field. A little option football now. Michael Owens trying to turn the corner and does. Grabs a piece of it before he's uh, shoved out of bounds at about the 46. For those of you who had a chance to watch some of that uh, Big Apple NIT last night on ESPN, Billy Owens for Syracuse starring, and of course his uh, older brother Michael going to get a chance to play here tonight. Well, he's going to play a lot. He's got excellent talent, and uh, watch number 87 where he lines up. You saw him go in motion from the slot that time because he likes to lead on the small defensive backs. He's 250 pounds and can really block downfield. Again, it's Owens, cuts through a hole, keeps churning inside the 45, down to about the 43. Uh, Daryl Whitmore in on the tackle, a 10-yard gain that time for Michael Owens. This is one of the favorite plays of Syracuse. Watch number 62, the offensive right tackle. They start off to the right, and then see him pulling right there, right down the screen? It's almost a quick counter because they don't actually counter with the back, but they run the off-tackle play and let him cut back into the counter following the pulling tackle. It's one of their favorite plays and one that, I mean, that West Virginia was really worried about because he gets there so quickly that it can break on you. First and 10 for the Orange now. Mounting a, a drive. Play action. 
action, and there you see, back at the 45-yard line, Phil Cox's feet simply slipped right out from underneath, and he looks a little disgusted. Well, you know that would never happen on a dry turf because you have great footing on AstroTurf. You would not slip like that, but again, that's what's going to happen with the weather that we're facing tonight. Of course, Phil Cox faces more than that. He's had a bad thumb all year long. We watched it yesterday when he was taking snaps. He looked okay, but he didn't really have the zip on the football. There's that thumb, and that's the way it's taped up tonight. We know that's got to hinder him some. It cannot be just like having a free thumb. First time we've seen the four receiver set. Only a single back, and that's Johnson for blocking purposes. Second down now and a bunch. Or draw. <laughs> There it is, the old linebacker, Stan White. You saw that one all the way. That's obviously the play that you look for in that situation. Second and long is a key drawdown. You'll see both of those te these teams in second and 10 plus go to the draw, go to the screen, because you're hoping you can get a big chunk of that yardage back and then get the first down on third and medium. But they got, they got about five on that, makes it third and 15. They were hoping to break for probably around 10. Dick McPherson, we had a chance to chat with him last night and uh, what a classy individual. Huh? Really loves his team, his coaches, the university, and uh, he's enjoying life. Both coaches are credits to their universities. You can say that about this game without any doubt. Look for plenty of pressure this time by the Mountaineers. Here they come. Phil Cox has got to scramble for his life. Owens gathers it in, and he's down at about the 36-yard line. Yep, not Owens Rattle. Let's make that Duvall Glover. Well, we hear about Major Harris and his scrambling. Todd Philcox does a pretty good job of buying time himself because one of his problems is he's not a great runner. Not problems, that's just one of the things that he was born with. He's not a great runner, but watch him get away from the defensive back, Bo Orlando, blitzing from the outside. He steps up to the middle, finally spots Duvall Glover over the middle and gets the pass off. He's short of the first down, but they're now in four down territory and have the opportunity to make the first down on fourth down. First big decision for Dick McPherson, and the Orange will go for it. Oh, my, what a play that time turned in by Glover again. He's got the first down. A good, a well-conceived play. He goes in motion, gets the, def the defense starting to adjust if he was going across, overcommitted a little bit, then he comes back. And they're almost in the backfield when they snap the ball. He sneaks out into the flat, and they know they only need three or four yards. He gets the ball to him quickly before number three, Alvoid Mays, can come up and stop him short of the first down. So a well-conceived fourth and three play. Coverage pretty good that time by Mays. Not good enough. Yep, trying to keep the drive alive now. Seven nothing, West Virginia on top. Stretching out inside the 30 to about the 20 inch. Robert Pickett, you know, in the tackle that time. Daryl Johnson, he's really a load. Well, he's six foot one, 240 pounds. You've seen he can run the ball. He, we know he can catch. He blocks well. He's just an all-around fullback. I mean, true fullback. You don't find a lot of true fullbacks with the advent of the one back, with the advent of the eye, where they become blocking backs quite a bit. This guy's a true fullback. He can do it all. Officials coming out to respot. Syracuse loses about a quarter of a yard, or a, a, a yard, I should say. No lives on this field today, Benny. <laughs> These guys are athletes. Second down, now and seven. With 2.52 left to go here in the opening quarter. Option was faked, and the ball was batted down right at the line of scrimmage. Theron Ellis, one of the players that got a big mid on. Devon Glover was wide open on the play. This is the option where they bring the corner back up to have to take the pitch. Let's watch the big hand of Theron Ellis. He goes down the line. He's wide open. Ellis jumps, knocks the ball down. Remember, he's the guy that blocks extra points and field goals, too. He has a 41-inch vertical jump. I guess that's why you can jump up and knock passes down. Phil Cox now 3 of 4 here in the opening quarter for 24 yards. A 
looking down the middle. He's going for it all. And hang off the shoulder pads of Rob Moore. I think they stopped the play before it even started, Denny. One of the uh, back judges threw the flag. I think it was the 25-second clock had run out, so that play would have been uh, null and void no matter what had happened, whether Moore had caught the ball or not. But he was wide open for the six points. Delay a game on the offense. We will add five seconds to the clock. It's amazing to me how much time that Phil Cox spends at the line of scrimmage. And as we talked to their offensive coordinator last night, he said that normally Todd will change probably 70 or 80 percent of the plays by the time he gets to the line of scrimmage. As we said before, yeah, some of those are small changes. Some of them completely from run to pass. Some of them they change the formation and have to shift around. And you're going to run out of time. But that time, I don't think that was a problem. I think he just wasn't watching. Now, West Virginia has put in their dime defense. Mass substitutions. That's something that Bob Shaw, their new defensive coordinator, has brought with him from his pro experience. He brings in pass rush specialists. He brings in defensive backs, six of those. We'll see if it's effective here on third and long. We need 11 for the first down. Once again, here comes the option. Nobody takes Phil Cox and finally dragged down out of bounds at about the 22-yard line. And that's almost where the stick is, the 22-yard line for the first down. Again, a good call, an audible by Phil Cox at the line of scrimmage. If there's a weakness when you have four linemen that are going to rush and six defensive backs, there's only one linebacker, Chris Herring, number 49. It's the option because everybody's downfield covering. There's nobody for the quarterback. They overplayed the pitch, which you've got to do if you've got the option between Phil Cox and Owens running the football. Chris Herring finally comes over as the only linebacker to make the tackle. Phil Cox has really grown in leaps and bounds since the second game of the season when he was pulled out against Ohio State. And the good thing there, Danny, is the next time will they bring the dime in again. Syracuse, I mean, that's a big play for Syracuse. If you can keep them out of those specialty defenses where they're blitzing, where they're putting a lot of pressure on you, where they have the people they want in the game because you can defeat them, then you're up on it. You're, you're, a, you're a page up on, the, on what West Virginia wants to do. Both teams have had long, sustained drives now. West Virginia made theirs pay off. Craig Taylor with the touchdown. First down and 10. And balance line now. Quick pitch to Owens, turns it inside, squares up, and is near the 15. They brought in Andrew Dees, number 86, who's a freshman, but he's 6'7", 242 pounds. They lined him up at the weak tight end and motioned him over to the strong side. So they had an extra blocker, which opened up. He was able to kick the uh, defensive back out, and Owens had a good gap to run. Well, we've got an injured player down on the field. We'll be back in just a moment. It's West Virginia 7, Syracuse. 218 left here in the opening quarter. It's been a good one thus far. Daryl Whitmore, the uh, freshman safety, shaken up there. Second down now and four for Syracuse. Trying to punch it in here and tie this one up. positioning by the defense you want to play your position take care of your responsibility stay at home Michael Owens right down the line trying to find that gap in the defense he doesn't find it Al Boyd Mays finally comes up makes the tackle makes the hit there you see the ball pop out in the ground caused the fumble which in college football cannot do some good blocking spins inside near the 10 yard line that's enough for the first down power football that time led by Daryl Johnston 
knocking people's helmets off here. You see 32 leading 44 Michael Owens into the hole. Now watch the hit right here. There's going to be a helmet flying out of here somewhere. There it is on the ground to the left. Number 22, Bo Orlando, lost his helmet. There's going to be a lot of big hitting in this football game. Bill Cox looking to the end zone. Going to lob it too high. That went over the head of Andrew Dees. Andrew D is probably the most disappointed player. He hasn't caught a ball all year. That would be a big first catch of the of your career, wouldn't it? He's a 6'7, 242-pound freshman. Phil Cox knowing that height threw it up high. Sandy is surprised at how well that Phil Cox has eluded the rush thus far. Well, we've seen that he's able to do things. He doesn't look that great doing them, but uh, he's got the job done uh, without any flash like McPherson had, but he's got the job done. He's an efficient quarterback. 17th play of the drive. Phil Cox keeps it himself, and he's close. Going to give it up, though. Looks like the Mountaineers have it at the goal line. We talked about him getting the job done. He comes down the line of scrimmage. Pat Davis, the tight end, is leading him. Nobody takes him. He gets hit as he dives forward towards the goal line. Bo Orlando hits him on the arm and knocks the football out. You wonder, maybe the right thumb has something to do with that. He's carrying it in his right arm. Bo Orlando lost his helmet again. Now Harris going to scramble around in the end zone. He's going to have to be careful. Dodge is out near the five for the six. And he's, uh, he's interesting to watch. Well, that'll be the final play, more than likely, of the opening quarter. It's uh, been very interesting thus far. As the Mountaineers of West Virginia lead 7-0 here over the Orangemen of Syracuse. She was a redhead about five foot six inches tall, and all of a sudden this thing starts spinning, and it's going round and round. And so that makes me safe, because with my wife, I'll never be that way. You still have your career and you're frustrated. I mean, that, that's what you want. Of course, that's just my opinion. So money's no object. Yes. Money's no object. What are we going to do with our lives? Well, so? that's the ball. Yeah. Levi's 100% cotton dockers. If you're not wearing dockers, not you're just wearing pants. I'm still paying the loans. I got all the money in the world. I'd like to at least be your pool man. <laughs> <laughs> something good to happen make it happen with the clean masculine scent of english leather cologne some guys have what others want some guys have it all english leather some guys have it all Your ticket to the NFL when the Patriots and Dolphins go head-to-head. -head. The Patriots pack the punch on their playoff drive that leaves opponents red, white, black, and blue. The Dolphins' Dan Marino connects with the Marx Brothers, Duper and Clayton, and offense is the secret word. The New England Patriots and Miami Dolphins battle head-to-head -head on NFL Sunday Night Football at 8 Eastern, live on ESPN.
West Virginia by a touchdown thus far after the opening quarter of play here from Mountaineer Field in Morgantown, West Virginia. The Orangemen. Backed up against their own goal line right now. The Mountaineers of West Virginia. Second down now and about seven. Tailback crashing over the left side out near the nine-yard line. Brings up third down and fairly short. Tackle that time by George Brooks. Big defensive play here for Syracuse. The first drive, they didn't stop West Virginia at all. Here they got the opportunity to keep them backed up, make them punt the ball out of their own end zone. By the time he lines up 15 yards deep, they'll have to kick it from the blue paint to, in the West Virginia end zone. So uh, it's a big play defensively to keep them from getting the four yards they need for the first down. Major Harris, 6'1", 207, and only a sophomore. We'll delay that time. Taylor, the fullback, crashes out over the 15 to about the 17, more than enough for the first down. Nice draw play, a little delay to Taylor. You can see the power that Taylor has. He's not the elusive fullback runner that you'll maybe get in Daryl Johnson, but he's as powerful as they come. If you give him a little hole, he gets into the secondary. He's going to carry linebackers and defensive backs for extra yardage. Pro scouts have been watching here. Uh, him here in the last three or four weeks. Mid-round choice, perhaps. Harris slips for a moment, lets it go, though. Pass is complete. Keith Wynn in on the reception that time. Keith Wynn, a converted wide receiver. He's uh, just getting back. He had some injuries earlier this season that have really hampered his blocking. But uh, he's an excellent receiver. Really gives him three wide receiver types in that passing offense for Major Harris. This time it's Remberts and Calvin Phillips put out to the right. Harris on the action. And when he squares those shoulders up, he's trouble. And the guy who threw the big block on that play was the guy we just talked about, number 81, Keith Wynn. He lined up at wide receiver and cracked back on the outside linebacker, the man who was going to take Major Harris. Watch the right side of your screen. See if you can see 81 coming in right there on the outside linebacker, the crackback. He was responsible for Harris. It's called a load. But this time they used the tight end coming in from the outside to free up Harris. here at the line of scrimmage. Hands it off to A.B. Brown. Tries the left side, but is chased out of bounds by Devin Holmes. You usually don't see quarterbacks audibling when there's a man in motion because it's hard for him to hear and whether you're going to get to the right formation. But when it's just a basic power play, if that's something you can do uh, from any set that you have, whether you have motion or not. West Virginia leading 7 to nothing, courtesy of a Craig Taylor one-yard plunge in the opening quarter. Crowd settling in a little bit, waiting for Major Harris to do something. This time he pitches off at the last moment to A.B. Brown, and he's wrapped up by Chris Ingram. The one thing Syracuse did not want to do was overcommit to Major Harris. To put all their eggs in the basket if they stopped Major Harris, they would win this football game. Because when you do that, and that's what West Virginia wants you to do, because that opens up those big play wide receivers who are both averaging well over 20 yards a catch, Reggie Rembert and Calvin Phillips. So they're sitting back, they're going to make Harris beat them in their normal defense. Three wide receivers. Harris looking deep. Rembert at the last moment has the ball batted away. Looks for a flag, but doesn't find one. <laughs> I tell you, Major Harris's eyes lit up. He had number 59, David Bavaro, matched up on Reggie Rembert man to man. You see him five yards behind with the two deep safeties. This time, 38. David Holmes, who was playing a deep half of the field, is really a corner, came over to break up the pass, but Bavaro was badly beaten on the play, and he will be when you're covering wide receivers. Back deep is Chris Ingram. And he's going to let this one roll. Down at about the 20-yard line, 44-yard punt. So 
with West Virginia leading seven to nothing here in Morgantown. We'll be right back. Last year, Syracuse beat West Virginia dramatically in the final 10 seconds with a two-point conversion, 32-31. Here's how the radio call sounded in Syracuse. Syracuse trails 31 to 30 with 10 seconds to go for a two-point conversion. Donnie McPherson, long count, option to the other side of the field. He pitches to Owen. Yes! 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 Oh, yeah! Yeah! Oh, boy, what a play that was! to pass out the throat lozenges after that stand. Why, of course, we'll be tracking both those radio networks here this evening as well. Interesting to see if we see a lot of people running on the field tonight, like you saw there in Syracuse, like it was a couple weeks ago here when they beat Penn State. First down and 10 for the Orangemen. They trail 7-0. Now quickly... Johnson for four or five yards. Let's head back now to Tim Brando for an update. All right, Vinny, the story. Who's going to go to the Orange Bowl? Oklahoma with fourth down. Just over a minute to play. Charles Thompson stopped here on fourth down. Watch the hit by Willie Griffin. Thompson was injured on the play, and apparently the Huskers on their way. They just got the victory, 7-3. OU's three points is the fewest points they've scored in the game against Nebraska since 1942, Denny. And we'd like to welcome all of you who just... Watch the end of that game here to Morgantown, West Virginia. Mountaineers leading 7-0. A little counter this time to the tailback. Nice call that time. Give it to the fullback up the middle on the first play. He gets six. You fake it to the fullback up the middle of the second play. You get the defense sucked to the middle. And then you give it to the uh, tailback. Off tackle. Good yardage. A little surprised at this point, Stan. We haven't seen the ball go up in the air a little more often. Both these teams pretty much sticking to the ground. Well, they're both power football teams that like to run the option, but will throw if you give it to them. Right now, they're feeling that they want to see what they can establish running and then go to the air if they have to. His time looks downfield. Mays with the coverage at the last moment. Duvall Glover almost gathered it in. And here we go. Uh oh, look at this. 28 16, huh? Notre Dame with a big win as well today. Well, Notre Dame, the 7 3, Nebraska over Oklahoma. Michigan over Ohio State, 34 31. 49 28, Oklahoma State. And Clemson wins that big shootout. First down and 10 now at about the 45-yard uh, the line for Syracuse. They moved the ball pretty well, haven't been able to put up any points as of yet. Option. Pitch and out it comes. Turning the corners, Drummond. He skips out of bounds as he crosses the 50 to about the 49. Al Boyd Mays providing the stop. You know, the previous play, the first down pass, that's what you're talking about throwing when you want to throw the football. We talked about why they hadn't put it up the air. Obviously, the weather will have something to do with that. Phil Cox's thumb may have something to do with that. You want to throw when it's most advantageous to you, when the other team is expecting you to run. First down is one of those situations. That's why it was effective. West Virginia defense is giving up less than 284 total yards per game, so they're a pesky bunch on the defensive side of the football. Second down now and five. Davis in motion out of the slot. Option again. Uh-oh, nobody home this time. And Drummond cuts it up inside the 40 and down near the 30-yard line to about the 31. 17 yards on the carry. Well, the reason there was nobody home is because Pat Davis, who's 6'3", 257, was blocking on Bo Orlando, number 22, who's 5'10", and 173. They take the fullback, Ronaldo uh, Turnbull, number 87. Now, look downfield, right here. There, one by any blocks. He blocks 22. He gets in the way of three's way. Alvoid Mays, that's Pat Davis, a 250-pound tight end that made that go for the tailback, Robert Drummond. Drummond, 34 yards now on five carries. He needs 54 yards yards to surpass Jim Brown in the all-time rushing list. 
delay this time, and Drummond nowhere to run. Barely gets back to the line of scrimmage. Probably even lost about a half a yard. Mike Fox and Ronaldo Turnbull in on the stop. Dave Drummond loves to play against West Virginia. <laughs> he has 100-yard games the last two years against this group of Mountaineers. So he's coming today hoping to add a third one. Dick McPherson pacing the sidelines. Second down now to about 11. Ball spotted on the 32. turn the corner gets hit once it's now inside to about the 26 yard line Robert Pickett in on the tackle and a good lead block by Turnell Sims and also downfield by Daryl Johnson boy if you think this one is good what about coming up next Miami Florida ranked number three LSU number 11 9 p.m. Eastern CFA football action on ESPN Four teams ranked in the top 15, back to back, right here tonight on ESPN. Can't ask for more than that. That's why they call it Showdown Saturday on ESPN. Well, the fans are rising to the occasion in West Virginia's defense. Bill Cox with time, dumps it over the middle. Oh! And a man wide open at about the five just overthrew him that was Daryl Johnson and he was matched up on Chris Herring their leading tackler as a linebacker but he put a little move on Herring and went right by him down the middle Phil Cox just missed him that's a that's a pass that you have to hit as a quarterback that's the easy throw directly down the middle with no deep safeties Kevin J Green is on to attempt a 43 yard field goal 13 for 15 on the season It's long enough and it's good. So Syracuse is now on the scoreboard. The 7.56 left here before the halftime intermission. It's now West Virginia 7. ESPN's Showdown Saturday is being brought to you by Volvo. A car you can believe in. By Heil. Heating and cooling. Depend on Heil. They're born to run and Xerox, of course, the antifreeze coolant for extreme conditions. It took him a while, but Syracuse finally got to the scoreboard standpoint. They got their three points on the board. You know, they fumbled deep in the one-yard line their last drive. This time, nine plays, 55 yards. It ends up in a 43-yard field goal by Green. Now, the place kicking of Syracuse itself is a story. Ten years in a row. It's hard to believe, Denny. They've not missed an extra point for 10 years. The anniversary was yesterday. That tells you how accurate the kickers are. He's now 14 out of 16 in field goal attempts. You can talk about DiMaggio and Oil Hersheiser and all those streaks. Ten years without extra point rates right up there. Eugene Napoleon back deep for West Virginia. Green with a nice kick. Napoleon's going to bottle and then think the better of it. And the Mountaineers will start first and ten from their 20. I guess the nice thing for Syracuse, Stan, is the fact that when you can run the ball and hang on to it, Major Harris doesn't have a chance to come on the field. Well, you'd love to be able to sustain that. Now, you, I obviously think that West Virginia is going to change their attitude a little bit to get the ball back to make some big plays. And that may open it up for Syracuse. But uh, Syracuse's game plan of staying back, playing their zone 78% of the time, and trying to keep Major Harris from the big play is working so far. First and 10 from the 20. Oh, my. Under Johnson. It's drilled right about the 21 yard line by George Brooks. And also, Rob Burnett came in to make a big hit on that play. And Burnett's a guy you're going to see put a lot of pressure. I don't know if he, even he, though, can run down Major Harris in that pocket. Tough to sack Harris just because of his escapability. You see Mr. Green exhorting the troops there and told, hey, get me in position. I'll kick the field goals. Second down and long for the Mountaineers. Harris 
Gets over the middle, has Edward Johnson wide open. He's wrapped up very quickly by Dan Busey after about a six-yard gain. Brings up third down at about three. There again, you drop back. You make him throw it underneath. He doesn't like to do that in going into today's game. Anthony Brown only had two catches. The other tailback, Andre Johnson, only had three. They don't throw very much to those tailbacks faking through the line, but when you're taking away the deep play like Sergio's going to do, that's where you have to go. Harris with plenty of time, and he hits win his tight end as across the 35 and the 36 for a first down. Now let's go down to John Snyder for a report on those home team footballs. We talk about the footballs, and a lot of people don't know that each team brings its own footballs to the game. For example, the ball that Major Harris just threw is one brand. With Todd Philcox is in the game, it's another brand. They've both been approved by the officials. The Syracuse football, the one I have right here, is a little bit softer. The Syracuse receivers seem to like that a little better, but they're not exactly the same ball. So hoping John might have one more and do a little uh, juggling for us, perhaps, down there on the sideline. Well, here he is, the master of the broken play, and he gets away with murder one more time, crossing the 40-yard line. He's tough to track down. Again, these are designed broken plays. Right away, they're looking for the pursuit. They hope to get over pursuit and then let him just use his escapability, his speed to go back. See, he's already decided he's going to go back the other way. He's just faking. It's almost a quarterback counterplay. They're blocking on that line of scrimmage, waiting for him to come back. Almost got the little he tripped over a quarter in the sideline. Second and six. This time Harris will run the action. No need to pitch, and now he does at the very last moment to Johnson, who tight ropes across the 45. Well, how tough is it with a quarterback that can turn up and then pitch downfield? Again, though, did you see which direction they had him running? East and west, in which they don't want him to get his shoulders turned upfield. That's when they feel he makes the plays that breaks the back of defenses. If they get him running east and west across the field and then pitch the ball late, you don't get the big play. Out come the sticks and the chain. In his eighth year, Norm Gerber's the defensive coordinator at Syracuse, and he talked about that very point last night. He said, if you let him square up at the line of scrimmage, you're in for a long evening. His whole philosophy, don't give them the big play. Make them earn it up and down the field. The amazing thing for West Virginia on the season, passing-wise, they're averaging better than 20 yards of pass play through the whole season coming in here this evening. Well, you know why? Because people start saying we're going to stop Harris, we're going to bring up our free safety to stop Major Harris on the option, and he hits Rembert and he hits Phillips on the big plays. They're averaging 23 and 25 yards a catch, just inches or less than inches to go for a first down. Offensive coordinator Mike Jacobs up in the booth, and there you see Don Neeland down on the sidelines. I can remember when uh, I was playing against O.J. Simpson. One game, we decided we were going to stop O.J. Before we knew it, it was 28 to 7. We said, let's go play back our regular defense. We ended up winning that game 42 to 35. Syracuse so said as long as they could, they would stay in their base defense and just do what they've done all season long. Rembert in motion. And the major will take care of this first down himself. 6-12 left here before the halftime intermission. 7-3, West Virginia on top. Craig Taylor opened up the scoring in the opening quarter, and then a uh, Kevin J. Green field goal made it 7-3. And, of course, uh, coming up tomorrow on ESPN, Doug Flutie and the New England Patriots will take on the Dolphins down at Joe Robbie Stadium live at 8 p.m. Eastern. And then next week on ESPN, the Giants and the Saints. That'll be a dandy November 22nd. Gives on the counter, Andre Johnson shucks one tackler, crosses midfield, and is at about the 49. Ran a long way, but only for three yards. A counter play, a little slow developing. And Terry Wooten, the fine outside linebacker. I mean, he's one of the top linebackers in the country as a junior. He's got six sacks, four interceptions, which means he can blitz well, he can cover well. He's an all-around pro-type outside linebacker. And his younger brother, JoJo, is an outstanding player as well for Syracuse, only a freshman. Second down at seven. Johnson gets a couple of blocks. And gets belted at the 46-yard line, rolls near a first down, about the three yards shy. Chris Ingram shouldering in on the play. 
They end up having Grantis Bell, who's 5'9", 150, trying to block Ingram. And really, if they'd have had maybe Reggie Rembert out there, who's 6'6", 220, and could have got that block on the corner, and then, then he may have been able to get around there. But Grantis Bell is a uh, mismatch. Andrew Johnson's only started a handful of games in West Virginia stand, but boy, what a great career. At fifth, and he's going to go up to fourth, maybe up to third before the night's over. Big third down play now for West Virginia. Harris with plenty of room, lofts it out, and Taylor had it on his fingertips and couldn't pull it in. Late flag on the play, coming from the other side of the field. It may have clipped uh, Terry Wooden coming in the backfield, or maybe Wooden retaliated. Wooden's clapping his hand, so that's what it is, a clip. I saw him block him in the back as he had beat the first uh, defender. The second one hit him right in the middle of the back, blocking before he could get to Major Harris. On the offense, the penalty is declined. Fourth down. Okay, that shows you the respect they have for Major Harris because clipping is a 15-yard penalty. Most of the time, you would say, "Hey, let's take those 15 yards of field position," but you don't want to give him even one more shot. Here's Lance Carrion, the senior punter for West Virginia. Back deep in single formation is Chris Ingram for Syracuse. Syracuse player. Yep. Bad bounce if you're a West Virginia fan at about the 27. So with 4.55 left in the first half, it's 7 to 3. West Virginia on top. Thought it might be one of those high scoring affairs, but it's 7 to 3 with 4.55 left here in the opening half. And after all those years, Stan White in the National Football <laughs> League, it, is this what you used to look through when you were playing? Well, that's the way it looked, and sometimes you were very glad to be able to hide behind that helmet and that face mask. Is that what, after the penalty you had caused or after the ball you had dropped? Oh. First down and 10 for Syracuse. Johnson, oh, tough yards inside. Let's head back to Bristol, Connecticut, and Tim Brando. Denny, a bizarre play in the USC-UCLA game. The Trojans punting the ball away, and watch Daryl Henley. He will look to lateral the ball right here, and when he does, the ball is botched in a fumble, and USC recovers. That would lead to a Quinn Rodriguez field goal to make it 31-16. Two minutes to play. If SC wins, they go into the Rose Bowl. They'll get Notre Dame next week. UCLA in all likelihood going to the Cotton Bowl. Denny? Thank you, Tim. Dick McPherson known for his trick plays, but obviously they're using it on the West Coast as well. Mm -hmm. Play action, Phil Cox looking downfield. He's got Davis open, and he is uh, bumped, and here comes the flag on the coverage that time. Robert Pickett, but he was clearly beaten on the play. Oh, yeah, he was open, wide open over the middle. Very uh, reminiscent of how open that uh, Daryl Johnson was earlier. But he gets the tight end on the linebacker, 6'3", 257 on Pickett, who should be able to stay with him, was 6'210". Of course, in college, is 15 yards from the previous spot, not to spot the foul. Pass interference against the defense. A 15-yard penalty and first down. See, he's wide open. He has to really come back away from the ball. But look at Pickett get his right hand over and around the neck of Pat Davis. Pickett's a pretty good linebacker, but he got beat on that one. That's when you need the helmet to hide behind, Denny, on something like that. And the collar. See, that's the easy throw for the quarterback. Over the middle, no deep safety. Only pass interference stopped the completion. First and ten now for the Orange at their own 48. Trying to get something on the board before halftime. This time, Owens gets it. Right straight up the middle. Pops the ball up. And is it West Virginia's? Yes, it is. Well, they look like they may be. Uh-oh. They're having a conference about something right here. First indication was that it was West Virginia's, and that's what happened. It is. I don't know what they were talking about. But I guess they were trying to figure if it was a fumble or not. Well, it's 7-3. to three. West Virginia on top, and they have the football. We'll be back with more right after this.
WVU, an unbeatable combination. At Delphine's Incorporated, Capitol Street, Charleston, we design and manufacture these WVU pendants and rings. Wear your Mountaineer pride in exquisite crafted jewelry. Also, a large selection of rings, watches, and necklaces. At Delphine's, we're not just another jewelry store. We can design and create what you've been looking for. Delphine's Incorporated, Capitol Street, Charleston, across from the Lee Street Triangle. What a way to end a great season. Boy, this is the kind of bowl game I've always dreamed of going to. I can just see it now. National TV showing thousands of us in our blue and gold chanting, Let's go, Mountaineers. <sighs> We've been to a lot of bowls. <laughs> There's some great memories from those bowls. But I have a feeling this one might be the best yet. Key Centurion Bank Shares congratulates the Mountaineers and wishes them the best of luck in the Fiesta Bowl. What Volvo knows about building cars, other companies would like to know. The expertise to develop such advances as an ingenious multi-link independent rear suspension and to incorporate a remarkable anti-lock braking system. And now Volvo's most coveted secrets are for sale. They can be found in the 760. Here's a turnover. Michael Owens on the speed counter here. You see the great block that springs him free. He runs over his own lineman, spins out. And what's the man from behind coming right there? That's Jim Gray. Knocked the football loose from behind. Second turnover, second fumble by Syracuse. For the Mountaineers take over. And they'll have a chance to put some points on the board perhaps before the halftime intermission. Quickly, though, nice play up front by the defensive interior, Keith Freiberg and also Fred Dirigi in on the tackle. Let's take a look at that fumble one more time because the turnovers are the story of this first half. Syracuse has dominated the play. But watch over the right here inside the circle. See the ball pop out. He's hit from behind. And the ball pops out. And West Virginia comes up with the football. Chris Herring right there recovers it for West Virginia. Harris back. Looks to the sidelines. And this time it's dropped by A.B. Brown. Throughout most of the season, the backs have not caught a lot of passes, Stan. That's right. Maybe that's a reason right there. <laughs> but, you know, we or saw Syracuse has taken away some of the other things. Well, we right? saw a drop by Craig Taylor, but they want to make him throw to the backs, keep those wide receivers in the game. The crowd has to be restless. They're averaging well over 50 points a game at home this year. Well, one would suspect, though, if they just beat Syracuse here this evening, they'll be delirious in Morgantown. Third down of 10. Harris with one pump fake. Now he's going to take off. That's what he does so well. And near the 40-yard line, a 14-yard gain before Busey finally catches up. And Danny, this is a formation that I mentioned to you that I would run all day if I was West Virginia. It's a three-wide receiver, single back. He spreads the uh, defense out with his abilities. You further spread it out by putting three wide receivers in the game. So if nobody's open, just let him take off. He's going to beat those four linemen. He's going to find a hole and get downfield in the secondary. He's made big play after big play in that formation. 2.58 left to go here in quarter number two. Rembert's in motion. Harris trying to make another big play. Brown this time inside the 33 and let's head back to Tim Brando. Denny to further prove how important that botched fumbled punt by UCLA was. On their next possession after the field goal by SC Aikman to Brendan McCracken, 26-yard touchdown. They were forced to go for two, failed, 31-22. The onside kick recovered by Southern Cal. They control with under a minute to play in Pasadena. Denny? Well, that's one that they'll think about for a long time. Oh, look at this play. Fake to the fullback. He takes off on his own inside the 25 to about the 22. His biggest plays have been the designed broken play. The quarterback counters off the option. They fake the option going to the left. Now he stops. Now watch. He just comes right back. See the linebacker, number 55, Dan Busey, go with the flow. But vacates the hole back to the weak side. All Major Harris does is turn one way, turn back the other, and run. Calvin Phillips and Granis Bell split out to the left. Fullback fumble 
the ball. Syracuse on top of it, and uh, turnabout is fair play. As Wooden comes up with a fumble recovery, and both teams have driven the ball here in the first half, Stan, but they've had trouble hanging on. And how many times do you get to the big game and you see turnover after turnover? You're expecting a shootout, and all you do is he, the fullback wasn't even expecting the handoff. Somebody blew the play. Major Harris tried to give it to the fullback, and he wasn't even looking for the football. He did not even put his arm up. He was running to make a block. Now, somebody blew that. I don't know if it was Harris or the fullback. I have to think he's a fullback because Harris called the play. And that's not always the case. I've seen the quarterback go to hand off to the wrong man before. First fumble recovery of the season for Terry Wooden. Phil Cox on the delay. Johnson across the 30 to about the 33-yard line. Under two minutes to play if you're Dick McPherson. Are you trying for more points? Right here is all the way from the snap. This is Phil Cox on the little delay up the middle to Daryl Johnson. You see he broke the middle of the West Virginia defense. A little quick trap. And you give him the ball. He can run inside. He's a great, great runner from tackle to tackle. First and ten, Phil Cox. Over the middle, and this one is picked off back inside the 30 to about the 28-yard line. Theron Ellis, who is really having the game of his life here this evening. And they're looking for Daryl Johnson over the middle. We talked about Ellis, his great athletic ability. They moved him inside. The officials are... Uh, Discussing something at this point. Got a face mask on the defense during the run back. Five yards penalty. Five yards. Have to move it even closer, but Phil Cox does not see Theron Ellis. Watch him come from the right side of your screen. He's looking at Johnson come over the middle. He hooks over. He throws it as he breaks, but he threw it to where he was going. If he threw it to where Johnson was, it probably would have been completed. At least it would not have been intercepted. A bad read by Phil Cox. It was a zone, and he hooked up. And for those of you who have just finished up watching USC and UCLA, we've got a good one here in Morgantown, West Virginia. 7-3. The Mountaineers on top. They've got the football. Slashing run inside the five-yard line. Down near the goal line is A.B. Brown. Yards on the carry that time for Brown. Face mask on the defense. Half the distance to the goal line. First down. Just nope. power football after power football, Denny. Just off tackle play. Just like on the first drive, they hit the gap, and there's the 10, 15 yards before you know it. 114 left in the first half. And it's Taylor over for the touchdown, his second here of the evening. over rallying his troops saying it's not over don't get down they came back last year we can come back this year Bowman in to try the extra point and the Mountaineers bounce back it's now 14 to 3 with 107 left here before the halftime intermission Again, just a quick handoff to the fullback. He's the closest man. He gets there before the linebackers can fill. You almost read the linebackers. If they're deep, you either sneak or go to the fullback. If they're up tight, then you go to the tailback and can jump over top. Don Nealon, you know he's going to enjoy this to get that second touchdown just before halftime after that turnover. He was as nervous as probably he's ever been from people that have known him as we talked to him yesterday. He didn't want to seem nervous, and he tried to downplay the fact that he was nervous and how loose everybody was, but you knew that uh, things were real tight because he's never won 
10 in a row before. He's never had an undefeated season. This was a capping of his coaching career. Taylor started it off with a one-yard plunge in the opening quarter. West Virginia led 7 and nothing, and then Green with a 43-yard field goal cut the deficit to make it 7 to 3. Taylor one more time. He now has 10 touchdowns on the season. And West Virginia has cranked up the ground game. And they've taken advantage of a big turnover there to lead now 14 to 3. Pretty good field position there. Walker, though, tripped up at about the 27 yard line. The fans starting to get a little riled up here at Mountaineer Field. <laughs> 102 now left before halftime. Big touchdown there, Stan White. Makes it 14 to 3. And what do you do if you're Syracuse here? You just fumbled, you just threw an interception. There's a little over a minute left in the half. You're down 14 to 3. You go after points and risk another turnover? Well, I think you better. West Virginia is probably going to score more before the night's over. Bill Cox over the middle has his tight end. Davis slips and slides across the 35 to about the 37. Bo Orlando on the tackle. Hurry up offense now. Halftime, Tim Brando and, uh-oh, the prophet, Beano Cook. He can run for governor here in the state of West Virginia. And I think Stan Wynn going away. There's signs all over the place. They wouldn't have to make up any. Good protection for Phil Cox. Plenty of time to throw. This time he hits Owens, who's wrapped up at the 44. They're just going downfield. There's the hurry up offense. They're running everybody down and hooking against the zone defense for West Virginia. I'm sure West Virginia will stay back maybe one, maybe two more passes, and then they'll bring everybody. There's uh, one of his political signs. <laughs> Why should West Virginia win here tonight and then maybe beat Notre Dame in the Fiesta? Well, over the middle again. Oh, tough play there. Rob Moore had it right in his hands and dropped it at the 40-yard line. It's called hearing footsteps. When you come over the middle like that, you know you're going to get walloped when you catch the football. He was trying to catch that against his body so he could get the football and protect himself at the same time. It just bounced right off him. Receivers have to catch the ball with their hands, especially in the crowd. The interception that Deron Ellis picked off was only the eighth interception in over 200 throws this season for Phil Cox. He's been very accurate. Second down and 10, and they're running out of time. again huh? and up at about the 42 yard line kind of a strange play there yeah Ternell Sims got the reception the ball was batted in the air <laughs> once it's batted by a defensive player it's fair game for anybody to catch this time it comes down to an offensive tackle and we'll take a break with 18 seconds left here in the opening half West Virginia 14 Syracuse three. a concerned Dick McPherson and rightfully so his team trails 14 to 3 Phil Cox, 7 of 12 for 55 yards and one interception. On the delay, Johnson with running room across the 40, finally wrapped up at about the 36-yard line. And timeout quickly called by the center, John Flannery, after a 22-yard run. I believe one timeout left. They're down to the... Uh... 37 yard line a little inside the 37 I would imagine they're thinking one play and then a field goal get maybe 10 or 15 yards but pretty good call here they've got everybody dropping back real deep taking away the passing lanes give the ball to the most dependable player Daryl Johnson on the draw play he goes up the middle and gets 22 yards let's look at it from the back you see sets up Nice cross blocking. Really what happened, one of the defenders fell down for West Virginia, number 94, Chris Parker. Finally, Chris Herring comes up with a tackle way downfield on Johnson, but they need about 10 more yards to get into good field goal range here. Well, I know it's much warmer right now in Miami as the Hurricanes and Tigers begin to heat up. Number three against number 11 coming up next on ESPN. Make that Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's probably warm down there as well. 
Johnson with a uh, word of advice for Phil Cox. He's got time. Looks downfield. The clearing pattern. This one's picked off at about the 10 yard line. Just overthrown. He had Devon Glover open. He had pulled up the linebackers with a tight end over the middle. If he could have hit Glover, they'd have been inside the 10-yard line. They'd have had good field position for the field, for the, uh, field goal. They'd have been only five seconds left. They'd have had to kick. But watch over your middle. Watch the tight end and the running back. They bring the linebackers up. And watch how open this is over the middle for Glover. But the ball's just overthrown. And right there to make the interception. Defensive back for West Virginia. Scoops it right off the turf. Preston Waters with the interception and Major Harris downs it. And they're hooting and hollering in Morgantown. It's 14 to 3. West Virginia on top. And now we'll head back to Bristol, Connecticut to Tim Brando for all the scores and highlights. All right, thank you very much, Denny and Stan. 14 to 3, the Mountaineers of West Virginia with the lead, and welcome to our Railback halftime scoreboard. Vino Cook is alongside, you know, the guy with all the billboards in, <laughs> in Mountaineer country. Scores galore on the way next. 14-3, Mountaineers at halftime. Ballad of Barry Sanders as we continue here with our showdown Saturday. It could be that the Heisman Trophy is in his future. He had another remarkable outing today, albeit against Iowa State. The numbers, hey, they don't lie. Here he goes, 25 yards for a touchdown. 21-13, Oklahoma State, his second TD of the day. On to the fourth quarter, 28-21, Iowa State leads. Third and seven with the ball on the 20. Just pitch it out to Barry. Are you ready? Look at him go. 80 yards, those are his numbers. 292 yards, four touchdowns on 32 carries. In the fourth quarter, 35-28, Oklahoma State ahead, ball on the 11. Give it to Barry. He gets into the end zone, making it look easy. Speed, power. He's got it all, doesn't he? The only problem is, he's a junior. He's playing for a team that hasn't been exposed on national TV that often. But look at those numbers. 47 yards to become the all-time single-season rushing leader. And, of course, that would break Marcus Allen's, Allen's mark. And the only problem there is that game will be in Japan against Texas Tech. All right, now, Bino Cook. West Virginia, you did pick them, but you know, if USC beats Notre Dame next week, they may have nothing to say in the matter. Well, that's right. If SC does beat Notre Dame next week and then beats Michigan the Rose Bowl, there's no doubt USC deserves number one. So right now, everybody is saying, come on, mm -hmm. ours, beat SC next week. Including, including West Virginia. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Definitely. Right. Definitely. I like the billboards, by the way. Well, that way like, proves you don't have to be bald. <laughs> All right, we'll be back to wrap it up here as our college football halftime show continues. The Mountaineers lead the Orangemen by 11.